All right, welcome to the Temple of Silver Stars public webinar. My name is Matthew. I'm an academic track instructor in the Temple of the Silver Star. Temple of Silver Star is a modern uh, mystery school within the Philemic and Golden Dawn traditions. Uh, and we offer structured training uh, in, in these mysteries in both our academic and our initiatory tracks. And for more information about our work, um, I'll give you some, some contact information on our website and things like that at, at the end of the presentation. So uh, good to see you all. Thanks for joining me. See, <clears throat> uh, yeah, as we go through, um, feel free to, uh, to type in the chat. Um, that'll probably be a little easier. I don't have my headphones in, so it'll probably be a little easier than uh, turning the audio on. Um, yeah, feel free to type in the chat uh, as we go through things. Um, yeah, let's just, uh, let's just jump right into it. All right, so uh, we'll be talking about, about divination uh, tonight. And so I just wanted to start with an explanation of uh, the, the title of the class, uh, The World is Bound by Secret Knots. Um, so I get this title from, uh, <clears throat> from uh, Athanasius Kircher. Um, some of you might be familiar with Kircher. He was a 17th century writer. He was a, a Jesuit, um, also an important uh, member of the, the Western esoteric tradition. Um, he wrote a lot about uh, various uh, esoteric mysteries. Um, and, and other topics. Um, he's probably most well known in our tradition now uh, for being the, uh, the originator of the particular form of the tree of life that we use, uh, the particular path arrangements and the, uh, the attribution of the, uh, the Hebrew letters to those paths is uh, Kirkland's version, that's what we use. Although we, uh, we don't use his for um, attribution of the planets to the Sephiroth, but uh, that's a topic for another time. But in any case, uh, this phrase, uh, the world is bound by secret knots. Um, you can see it in this, this frontispiece piece uh, to one of his works on magnetism. He was, he was very interested in magnetism uh, and some of the implications uh, of magnetism. And you see there, uh, our arcanist notice, uh, Ligantur Mundus, uh, the world is bound by secret knots, um, which I think is a very nice uh, evocative and, and resonant phrase um, with, with a lot of the things we're going to be talking about here tonight. Um, a lot of the, the sort of the hidden connections uh, between things uh, in, in their resonances. But it's actually another uh, uh, frontispiece uh, from one of Kirk's works um, that's actually a little bit more relevant to, uh, <clears throat> to our talk tonight. Um, so uh, here's another, uh, yeah, another image uh, from one of his, his books here. Um, and let's see, so in the center here, I uh, hope you can also see my cursor, uh, we see the, the Mundus archetypus, the, the archetypal world. And we see the, you know, the divine eye uh, in the triangle. And then in a single, similarly triangular uh, arrangement, uh, we have the three worlds, the, the Mundus Siderius, the sidereal world, and the stellar world. You can see there the globe of the heavens uh, and, this, and the, the belt of the zodiac. And here we have the Mundus Sublunaris, the, the sublunar world or the elemental world. Uh, and we see the four elements there. We see the earth uh, and the oceans and the waters surrounded by the atmosphere, surrounded by uh, what was believed to be uh, what they call the Empyrean heaven, the, the fiery region. That was thought to lie beyond the atmosphere that actually cor corresponds quite well to the, the magnetic sphere. Uh, and then over here, uh, we see the, the microcosm, uh, the small world, and we see a, a human figure there uh, with the seven, um, the, the orbits of the, the seven classical planets. Uh, and you can see the sun in the human's chest there, right? So these are the, the, three, uh, the three worlds descending from the archetypal world. And then around the outside here, uh, we see uh, many of the, the subjects of, of learning uh, of, of, of Kirker's time um, that he sees as all, as all bound together and all relating to the interconnections between the worlds. So we see here theology, then philosophy. Um, this here, uh, physica or physics, um, this would be more like what we think of as natural science uh, nowadays. Uh, and poetry, rhetoric, cosmography, Mechanics, uh, perspective. Uh, this means a visual, you know, perspective as as used in the arts, which was, of course, so important in the Renaissance. Uh, astronomy, music, uh, geography, arithmetic, and then magia naturalis, uh, natural magic, right? And so this is uh, magical practices uh, using the natural properties of the things like stones and plants. Uh, and then finally, medicine. And we see there the, the Pythagorean uh, pentagram. Uh, with the, the Greek word hagea, uh, meaning health, uh, written in the pentagram, which is a classical Pythagorean idea. Um, we just, I wanted to just spend a little more time. Uh, and so all of these are, are bound together, all of these, these different disciplines of knowledge uh, and, and schools of, of, of thought and learning and all of these subjects 
um, you know, Kircher saw all these things as, as bound together and, and linked uh, by, by secret knots. Um, in the center, we also see uh, another banner with a similar sort of slogan. Uh, we see uh, Omnia Notus Arcanus uh, Connexa Quiescum, uh, which means something like all things are silently connected uh, by secret knots. Um, and so all these different disciplines of knowledge, as well as the, the worlds um, from the microcosm, the elemental world, uh, and the celestial world are all, are all bound together. <clears throat> um, let's see, just go to the next slide here. So I, I rendered that, uh, that basic idea here as, as just a simplified uh, diagram here. So we see in the center uh, the archetypal world uh, with the, the, the divine, you know, the, the eye of providence, the, the divine eye there in the center. Uh, and then the, the stellar world, sublunar world, and, and the microcosm, or the, the little world, uh, which is in each individual human. And so we see the, you know, this is one way of, of looking at and expressing the, the classical hermetic idea of as above, so below, um, which you know, I think we can also think of as as within, so without. Um, but the, the, you know, what we can think of. Oh, sorry, my cat is knocking things over here. Yeah, here. Yeah. Um, uh, sorry about that. Um, where was I? <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. So you know, we can think of these these three worlds. Um, both you know the things that happen, these celestial cycles and the sort of heavenly cycles. Also, you know, what we I think nowadays talk about as as you know the astral world. Um, those those deeper patterns that lie you know beyond the manifest world. Uh, these things, you know, reflecting in, in the events of, of the, the physical world, you know, the sublunar world, or what in Kabbalistic terms we would call a saya, uh, and then also the, the microcosm, you know, the, the individual, that all of these things are mirrors and reflections of each other, and that even these three worlds and their structure is a reflection of this, this inherently triadic structure of the archetypal world. Now, for Kirker, you know, he's, he's a Jesuit, um, so I'm sure he's thinking of the, you know, the divine uh, triad uh, as, as the Christian trinity, but of course, it's, it's not the Christians who are the first to, to think of the divine uh, you know, as, as a trinity in that way. Um, that's something that they borrow from, from pagan philosophy. Um, you, know, you see that in, in a lot of Neoplatonism, uh, that idea of, of, of divinity, you know, the, the one uh, or the divine unity uh, pictured under the form of a triad. And so we can see this triad of worlds as reflecting uh, that divine triad. <clears throat> So anyways, all of that uh, is, is just sort of prefatory, uh, maybe to, to get us into a certain frame of mind uh, for being able to think uh, about, uh, about divination and about its, um, its relation to the, the magical tradition and the magical worldview and both the, the ways that, that the practice of divination and the fact that divination functions, uh, if, if you find that it does, uh, how that, what that implies about the world and also what sort of worldviews uh, and what sort of conceptions of, of the, the human mind and soul uh, and the nature of the world uh, support and allow for uh, you know, the existence and, and function of divination. So uh, just to start at the basics here, uh, divination can be, is, you know, in, in dictionaries is defined as the act of foretelling by supernatural or magical means, the future, or discovering what is hidden or obscure. Um, just a word about, about supernatural here. Um, if we think carefully about the, I think sometimes people uh, kind of object to the, the use of the word supernatural uh, and think that you know, magic is, is just part of nature. Um, but by natural here or, or supernatural here, uh, I think what we can understand is forces that are, are beyond or are kind of metaphysically prior to uh, the physical reality. Um, so we're just talking about the higher forces that inform what physically manifests. And so by divination, we are, we are tapping into those and manipulating or, or getting into connection or communication uh, with those higher forces. So the word divination uh, is, is from Latin uh, divinationum, uh, which means which is the, the power of foreseeing or prediction. Uh, and that word itself derives from divinare, uh, which is literally to be inspired by a god. And uh, that idea of divine inspiration is, is something we'll come back to a few times in our talk today. Now, in addition to the Latin root, um, we also see in, in a number of systems of divination, um, we see um, uh, the, the Greek root, uh, mancy, um, right? We have uh, like geomancy, uh, which is something we'll talk about tonight, as well as chiromancy. Chiromancy is, uh, you know, it's known as palmistry, 
uh, you're reading someone's fate uh, from, from the, the lines and other features of their poems. Uh, and so this root Nancy uh, is from the Greek Mantea, uh, meaning prophecy, divination, or oracle, uh, which is ultimately derived from mantis. Uh, seer, uh, which is from uh, menomai, um, meaning to be mad or raving. Um, and the Greeks had this idea of, of a kind of divine madness um, and that the, the presence of, of these, the ability to prophecy uh, and, and the, 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 the sort of divine presence, almost possession, uh, was a kind of divine madness. Um, and so that, that's an interesting thing to see. Uh, you know, we might also think of, of states of, of, kind of ecstasy and rapture that, that carry us out of normal states of consciousness uh, being, being related to this idea here. So it's interesting, just two different uh, roots there that ultimately connect together and um, express different aspects of the notion. Uh, let's see. So uh, definitive practices, um, as well as, you know, sort of what I'm calling here, like ominological traditions, um, just traditions of, of reading, uh, of reading signs, uh, importance, uh, sort of secret and hidden things within uh, within the phenomenal world. Um, these are things that are found you know, all throughout the, the world, um, all throughout all of human history. Um, I'm really not aware of any culture that didn't practice um, some things along these lines. Um, we'll be focusing on you know, the Western esoteric tradition, but I think it's worth just keeping in mind that this is this is quite a, a, a universal uh, a human thing, um, and that up until very recent uh, times in the Western world. Um, again, these are things that were practiced by, by, uh, by every culture and people. Um, and just a word about uh, kind of superstition. You know, of course, I think modern uh, you know, Western culture sees all of these practices as, as superstition. But it's interesting to note that um, even in cultures that had these practices, um, they had the idea of superstition. Actually, superstition uh, it, it is a, a you know, word from Latin um, that the Romans used to mean an excess of piety or, or um, Let's say I've got a quote from the Oxford uh, Classical Dictionary. Uh, Let's say that um, the, the superstitious were supposed to submit themselves to exaggerated rituals, to adhere in credulous fashion to prophecies, and to allow themselves to be abused by charlatans. Uh, so the Romans recognized that, that these sort of things could, if done in an excessive or unbalanced way, lead to what they call superstition. But they also understood that if done um, you know, in a balanced way or with, with skepticism and through the, you know, with, with the proper use of reason and maintaining you know, freedom for individuals, um, that uh, you know, there, there was a healthy form of this as well, which is something I think that our you know, kind of modern Western scientific materialist culture doesn't really recognize. Uh, let's see, Will uh, here is mentioning uh, the other dozens of, of Nancy's. Uh, um, named by uh, Rabelais and, and Pantagruel. Yes, there are. There's, there's some, I've seen some really long lists of all the different Nancy's. We'll talk about probably, or we'll mention maybe, maybe a dozen of them or so tonight, uh, but there's so many more that we won't even get to. All right, let's just keep moving on here. Um, so again, we're so coming back to some of these ideas about, uh, about worldview and, and how we conceive of reality and what sort of conceptions of reality um, allow us to, to think about divination and allow us to understand uh, divination in a, in a coherent uh, and, and consistent sort of way. Um, so uh, there's, there's a quote here from, from William Blake that some of you I'm sure have probably seen before. Um, he says, uh, may, may goddess keep from single vision and Newton's sleep. Um, you'll note that there's no apostrophe there in Newton's, it is possessive, but uh, Blake, um, Blake's use of uh, punctuation and, and even spelling and grammar are often quite uh, idiosyncratic. Um, and so this idea of single vision, I think is interesting. Um, you know, I think we can think about single vision as you're know, viewing the world from only a single lens. And in particular, you know, with the idea of Newton's sleep, it would be viewing the world um, as, as, own, as a mere uh, physical mechanism, um, as, as being, you know, only the interaction of, of physical systems, uh, and only that sort of material causality. Um, but avoiding that, avoiding single vision, um, you know, we have the idea, uh, I think, um, uh, I'm trying to talk there. Um, you know, avoiding the idea of, of single vision, you know, we can, we can view the world from multiple perspectives and be open to the fact that things, can, can, can exist on multiple levels. That's something that may happen for um, you know, perfectly understandable physical uh, uh, causes may also you know, view from other perspectives or you know, kind of Kabbalistically speaking, um, you know, from, from other worlds. 
come from the perspective of other worlds may have other significances and can be understood in different ways. Uh, and that these multiple perspectives on the world uh, can interact and support each other. Uh, and can have a much more complex and, and nuanced way of, of looking at the world. Um, and so one of these ways um, that I think we can, we can do this and something that, that resonates with, with everything we're talking about here is um, what's sometimes called organicism. Um, often this is in, in reference to, to you know, Platonic philosophy and, and to Plato's dialogue with Timaeus. Um, and the view of, of the cosmos uh, and, and everything that exists as an organic whole and as a living thing, um, something that is, is infused with, with soul, uh, with intelligence, um, and is, uh, yeah, is, um, is an organic uh, living system. And so we see this, you know, again, from ancient times uh, all the way into, into modern magic. Uh, I've got a great quote here from, um, from my favorite book by, by Israel Ligardi, uh, The Tree of Life. Uh, and Ligardi says, uh, the whole universe is permeated by one life, and that life and manifestation is represented by hosts of mighty gods, divine beings, cosmic spirits, or intelligences. Um, so yeah, right, again, this idea of, of, of the universe as, as alive and, and permeated by, by intelligence uh, and by a variety of, of animate beings. <clears throat> um, all right, and then finally, I've got a quote here from um, the, 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 the Roman uh, statesman and, and writer uh, Cicero from his text on divination. Uh, it's worth pointing out here that this is not Cicero's view here. The text is set up as a dialogue between uh, Cicero and his brother, uh, Quintus. So Quintus is uh, a Stoic, and so Quintus believes in, in divination. Uh, he also believes in the, in the gods uh, and all of this, whereas uh, Cicero is a, um, uh, an academic uh, skeptic. Uh, and so he ends up, he, he doesn't believe in divination and argues against uh, Quintus's position, but nevertheless, it's, it's one of the most important sources uh, on uh, what the, you know, the ancient world's uh, perspective on, on divination was. So anyway, C Cicero, uh, you know, in putting this into the mouth of, of his brother here, uh, says, assuming the proposition to be conceded, there is a divine power which pervades the lives of men. It is not hard to understand the principles directing those premonitory signs which we see come to pass, right? So divination is being understood uh, as, as related to uh, the, the omnipresence of the divine power and that this power pervading the, the, you know, our lives uh, is how we can begin to access how it is that, that divination can function and how it is that we can gain uh, the secret uh, knowledge, knowledge of the future uh, and other things along these lines. Um, via, you know, that, that it's through our the divine powers uh, pervading our, our existence. Uh, slides, there we go. All right, uh, I have another quote here um, from Cicero and uh, uh, in the, from the same text here. Again, these are, are words uh, he's putting in his brother's mouth. Uh, it says, there are two kinds of divination. The first is dependent on art, the other on nature. Now, to mention those almost entirely dependent on art, what nation or what state disregards the prophecies of soothsayers or of interpreters of prodigies and lightnings or of augurs or of astrologers or of oracles, or to mention the two kinds which are classed as natural means of divination, the forewarnings of dreams or of frenzy. Um, so, you know, this, this distinction between natural uh, forms of divination and those that are produced by some form of art, you know, that involve interpretation or learning uh, or some sort of skill. Um, that's not an incredibly important distinction, but I just think it's a nice illustration of the way that uh, the, sort of the classical world thought about these things. Uh, so just a, a few words here about um, uh, the augurs, for example, those were part of the Roman priests um, who in specifically uh, interpreted uh, the flight of birds. Um, and use those as, uh, you know, a, a, as answers to questions uh, and, and as oracles. Um, only specific birds were interpreted. These are eagles uh, and vultures were the two most common, since those are both uh, seen as birds of Zeus. Uh, but sometimes ravens, which are similar to Apollo, were used as well. Um, yeah, also we see, and we'll be talking about astrology. Um, the oracles, you know, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, um, for example, like the, the oracle of Delphi, and there's an image there on the left that you can see of, of the oracle of Delphi, the Pythia. Um, oracles were people, uh, often women, who entered into um, a kind of trance or, or altered state, 
uh, in which they were able to uh, to receive uh, you know, information uh, directly from, from the gods or from divine powers. And they often function to interpret um, omens. So, you know, for example, there are stories about, uh, you know, people um, maybe they encountering, you know, having something seemingly uh, 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 an omen uh, uh, happen to them uh, and then not knowing what it meant and then bringing their experience to one of the oracles who would then enter this altered state uh, and then interpret uh, the oracle that the person had encountered. Um, so they're not merely like the channels uh, for you know, the divine to speak through. They're not possessed in that, in that same way, um, but through the, the inspiration of the divine, um, they are able to, to interpret uh, the signs that occur in the world. Let's see, there's so much more we can say about that, but we'll just keep moving on here. Um, I just want to say a little bit more about, about this idea of the interpretation of signs. Um, so a great quote here from, from a really nice book by, uh, by George Kendall, um, uh, where he's, he's talking, the book is largely about divination uh, and, and some related subjects. And so, uh, yeah, this is just a passage from that. So Kendall says, uh, the serpent in the tree offering knowledge, mercury snakes, the hermetic power, the interpretation of signs, that which poisons single vision. Uh, right, and so single vision there, he's, he's referring back to that same uh, great quote uh, that we saw just a few minutes ago. Um, and you know, Pendle talks a lot about it in his writings. He uses the, the image and concept of poison a lot. Uh, and always with that, the, the, a very nuanced understanding of that concept and, and very often with the, um, uh, the, the Greek concept of, of the pharmacon. Uh, you know, pharmacon can mean both poison and cure. Uh, and so here, this idea of like a, uh, something that poisons single vision, and there's also the cure uh, for you know the um, the kind of error or, or deficiency of, of that or of that um, you know overly simplistic materialist worldview. Right, and then a little later, uh, he says, "A fork in the path. One way leads to an image of the world as a book, as a riddle, written in code. Each occurrence, a presage and glyph to a whole." The other way leads to randomness, mere chance, forever beyond our grasp, casting a, casting a shadow of nihilism on the accidental universe. Right? So again, this idea of, of worldviews and, and of multiple possible worldviews. Um, and obviously the, the first way there is the, the way of, of divination and the magical worldview, whereas the other is the, uh, the, the, the materialist path. Um, but he, he brings up this idea of, of mere chance uh, forever beyond our grasp, an accidental universe. And so in all of these systems of divination that we'll be talking about, um, uh, chance uh, and, and chance occurrences, coincidences, and all of these things play a role. And so it's, it's worth I think, just saying a little bit um, about conceptions of, of, of chance uh, and of love. Um, hmm. Okay, I'm going to just keep in mind just uh, uh, muting my, uh, the microphones and um, they, you can uh, ask people that say chat. Maybe the end of the day, the microphones on. You wouldn't mind uh, just muting for now. Um, let's see. So, classically, uh, you know, a chance uh, or, or, or fortune, uh, you know, were understood as, as actually divine powers. Right? So, you can make uh, uh, chances okay. Uh, and that's the, the goddess uh, superhero that's on the left. Um, she's holding in, in one hand uh, the, the cornucopia, and you know, the image is plenty, um, which is not merely uh, an image of, um, uh, you know, of what we think of as, as chance, um, but also sort of good fortune and luck, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the providence of that. Uh, and then you also see a, uh, uh, what do you call it? A, um, Blanking on the word, uh, you know, it, 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 um, so we go to the idea that it's do a kill or fortune. Yeah. Uh, that's yours for you. Uh, what are you doing? Did you want to cook to just I'm not cook? <clears throat> uh, oh, someone you can get it there. Let's so, do have more. I'm doing this up. Let's see, I think that should take care of it. <clears throat> okay. Um, yeah, I did. I, I just I, I just did it. Thanks, Jason. 
Thanks. I'm just getting, I'm still getting used to it. I know there's some way to just to mute all, but I'm not sure where that button is. Any place, I think it's all set. Um, right, so the, 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 the Greek goddess uh, 2K in uh, her Roman name is, is Fortuna, uh, right, which is where we get the word fortune. Now that sort of symbolism of, of the goddess fortune um, it persists you know, into, into the Christian world. Uh, and also the, connected with the image of the Wheel of Fortune, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with through the tarot. Um, in the Christian world, this ends up being understood in a, in a much more, um, I think, in a negative uh, uh, sort of way, of uh, these being seen as, a, as just like a blind force um, and, and very much um, with misfortune rather than something more like, more like providence or, or something meaningful. Um, but yeah, again, I think we'll, we'll be thinking a lot about, um, about, about chance and about things that come about by chance. And it's worth, again, thinking of, of chance as some sort of, as some sort of divine or, or animate um, or, or, or magical power rather than the way that we tend to think of, of chance being uh, an essentially meaningless thing, um, but thinking of chance as something meaningful. Um, also, of course, uh, connected to fate um, and to luck as well. You know, like luck is a kind of chance uh, but a sort of magical chance. Um, and we even see uh, a lot of ideas of, of luck, you know, like Lady Luck, you know, luck uh, personified uh, as a woman, a lot of you know, gamblers and things like that, talking about Lady Luck. Um, that's really a, a continuation of, of these ancient traditions of seeing um, you know, the fortune as, as a goddess. Um, and, and again, just uh, trying to contrast some of the, the different worldviews of these um, classical perspectives um, from cultures that you know, that, that spoke with the gods and, and, and the cosmic powers uh, and, and had these practices compared to our you know, modern uh, you know, materialistic world. However, we do see um, in, uh, in, in the modern world, um, you know, we do have uh, people um, like, like Jung, for example, like the quote from Jung, um, trying to, to, to rethink chance and to integrate some of these more classical ways um, you know, of, of, of looking at, of, at chance uh, and, and of fortune um, with, with more like modern and scientific perspectives. And so I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this already, um, but Jung, uh, Jung's concept of synchronicity um, is, is very relevant here. Uh, and yeah, well, I'll just read the quote here. This is from his, um, the foreword that he wrote to the Wilhelm Bain's uh, translation of the E. Chang. Um, and he gives, he gives much longer treatments of, um, of synchronicity as well, but he gives a nice kind of summary of his theory here. Um, so let's see, he says that uh, synchronicity is a concept that formulates a point of view diametrically opposed to that of causality. Since the latter is a merely statistical truth and not absolute, it is a sort of working hypothesis of how events evolve one out of another. Whereas synchronicity takes the coincidence of events in space and time as meaning something more than mere chance, namely a peculiar interdependence of objective events among themselves, as well as with the subjective or psychic, psychic meaning just like of the psyche of the mind, as well as with the subjective states of the observer or observers. So a few things here, um, he's contrasting um, coincidence with, with causality, or, or contrasting synchronicity uh, with, with causality. Um, because causality, you know, as in you know, the scientific method, is understood by repeating things, right? When you need experiments are undertaken, you have to undertake that same experiment many times. Um, and then you know, through statistical methodology, uh, you see what is, what is reliable and, and repeatable. Uh, and so that sort of way of thinking inherently involves like, the repetition of events that happen many times and always do the same thing every time that they happen. Whereas synchronicity uh, is about something that only happens once and the uniqueness of events and the uniqueness also of moments of time, um, the way that an event that happens you know, by chance somehow relates to the particular moment in time uh, at, at which that event occurs. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, this is interesting. Um, in, in one of Jung's uh, disciples, uh, Marie uh, Louise von Franz, um, she has actually a nice book about divination and chance and synchronicity. Um, and she really elaborates on that idea and talks about how um, the divination, you know, as well as synchronicity, these things are all about um, things that occur once um, in the way that uh, 
and, and how different that is from, from the scientific uh, sort of perspective, but it's not in any kind of contrast to it. It's not, um, you know, it, it's not an alternative view, um, but it's rather a, just a, or it is an alternative view, but it's not, uh, it doesn't contradict um, the scientific view. It just says that it's not only things that are repeatable that have meaning, but things that are, are unique and only occur in a single moment in time, that those things also have a different sort of meaning. So we can still have you know, all of the, the scientific knowledge and everything that comes with that, uh, as well as, as understanding the uniqueness of particular moments and the meaningfulness of things uh, that, that come about by chance. <clears throat> um, also, one other thing uh, that's worth pointing out here too is that uh, Jung's also talking about synchronicity between uh, like object, you know, outer events, objective events, and subjective states. Uh, and this, of course, is how a lot of synchronicity uh, happens and, and is understood. Um, that somehow the, the objective or the outer world seems to respond to the inner world. That you might be thinking about something and then at the same moment, you know, you overhear someone else, you know, say the same words that you were just thinking or some event that seems to come about in the world. It's, it's as if the outer world seems to respond or relate to the inner world. And so it's not causality. It's not that your inner state caused some event to happen, but that there's a kind of what Jung calls a peculiar interdependence. There's some sort of a, a meaningful connection that is non-causal uh, that, that we can read. Um, so it's a type, of, a type of relationship between events, whether those are multiple outer events or inner and outer events, um, that are not, they're event, things that are related, uh, but not by, by near causal mechanisms. All right, let's see, uh, we got a lot of stuff to get through here, so I'm just gonna keep moving here. Um, I mean, I won't spend too much time here, um, but just some other uh, things that we can think about in, in talking about different divination systems and about how divination systems work. I think there are a lot of interesting like philosophical and, and theoretical issues that that these concepts raise and that are, are worth thinking through. Um, so I don't want to give you any particular answers to these questions, but just some, some things for you to think about. Um, one thing, especially when we start talking about, uh, about prediction uh, and about looking into the future, we naturally, I think, come into the, up with the issue of, of fate versus free will. Um, you know, especially, I think we see this with, with astrology. Are we simply fated to do the things that are predicted? Are, um, are the, is there some amount, how much free will is there? How much, um, you know, how much room is there for us to be able to make different choices? <clears throat> um, another, and another interesting thing with that, I think also is, is looking at the, um, this sort of the difference between the, the Greek and Egyptian conceptions of fate. So for the Greeks, uh, fate is a higher principle than, than the gods, whereas for the Egyptians, it's the other way around. The gods are above fate. So in a kind of classical Greek way of thinking, um, you see this especially with, with the Stoics, nothing can change your fate. Uh, you, whatever it is that you are fated to do, whatever is fated to happen, there's absolutely no force that in any way that can change that. Whereas for the, from the Egyptian perspective, uh, the gods are able to alter fate. And so individual human, especially as the Egyptian uh, worldview spills into the hermetic tradition and various magical practices, there is the idea that, that individual you know, magicians um, by contact with divine powers are able to alter their fate. Um, or in the hermetic tradition, we have the idea of, of the hermetic ascent uh, of, of the hermetic practitioner ascending you know, beyond or above uh, the spheres of the planets and thereby becoming free of their fate because they are, are going to a, a sort of higher state uh, than those powers that, that give their fate. Um, so a lot of these magical traditions rely on this more Egyptian way of thinking that sees fate as, as open to negotiation um, if a, you know, contact can be made with the divine powers that determine fate. Um, another thing I think we see a lot in, in modern uh, talk about, uh, about divination is the idea of like psychology and fortune telling. Um, you'll see a lot of astrological texts and things like that that um, tend to sort of look down on the idea of, of what they call like fortune telling, you know, which is like the prediction of mundane events. Um, whereas they see the higher use of these techniques as being psychological. Um, I don't think there's any need to have to choose between these things. Um, I think we can see the psychological application of things like astrology as one application. 
Um, and I don't think there's any reason to look down on fortune telling as something, uh, you know, something vulgar or something like that. I think we can even see things like fortune telling as one other way of, of under, you know, when we're, we're predicting events uh, or, or talking about like practical, concrete things, you know, like maybe asking about money or something like that. Um, I think we can still see these as ways of looking at the world as influenced by these deeper patterns, uh, you know, divine or, or cosmic patterns. Um, so I think there's really no need to choose uh, between those things. <clears throat> see, uh, Trippy Squirrel here says, uh, yeah, faith being open to negotiation has founded many religions. Talmud says that uh, the sincerely religious Jew is not subject to astrology and the 12 apostles and 12 stages of dependent origination are thinly veiled gloss for, you know. Oh yeah, sure. The, those, uh, all those systems of 12 uh, are, are certainly related. That's interesting. I, I didn't know that the, the Talmud said that. Yeah, yeah thanks for that. Um, let's see, another kind of concept here we can think about, um, especially with some divinatory methods, are whether the, you know, the, the hand of the diviner is guided and, and to what extent that is true. Um, you know, I, I think this, I see this come up in, in tarot sometimes, um, you know, the idea of, uh, or the sort of questions about what happens when you ask a question and then shuffle the cards. You know, is it that there's a merely a, a kind of coincidence between the cards that happen to come out and the question that you asked, uh, or is it that there's some power that actually guides the shuffling of the cards and leads to particular cards like being laid down? Um, I think that's, that's something worth thinking about. Um, and then along some of these same sort of lines that we've already been talking about here, um, the question in astrology of whether the, the planets and stars cause things to happen uh, in the physical world or cause us to be a certain way, or whether they're merely signs or omens or indications. Um, certainly in, in most divinatory systems, there's no sense that like the, the tarot cards that you lay down will make something happen. Um, but when we, we talk about astrology, there is an interesting question that's worth, I think, spending some time thinking about about whether uh, you know, the, the movements of the planets are causing things or merely foretelling or indicating things. <clears throat> All right, let's just keep moving on here. Um, so I just want to say a few words about, uh, about the divinatory arts you know, in the Western uh, esoteric tradition. Um, you know, we talked about the classical tradition, made some reference to you know, these things in, in many other cultures as well, um, but we can start narrowing our focus a little bit here. One thing that's interesting to note is that many of the divinatory arts um, you know, that, that we practice in the Western esoteric tradition are, are things that, or, or let me say this differently, um, a lot of divination in the ancient like, classical world um, was directly connected to religious practices. You know, the oracles were oracles of a particular god. Um, you know, many, many oracles and diviners were part of the priesthood. Um, and similarly, a lot of other magical traditions, uh, magical practices can be traced back to you know, the religious, you know, to pre-Christian, you know, pagan, like religious practices. Um, for example, you can draw a very direct line from uh, the making of talismans, like astrological talismans, uh, back to uh, the Egyptian practice of the Egyptian priests in, in temples, uh, you know, drawing the, the power of the gods or, or different uh, you know, stellar powers uh, down into statues. Um, that practice directly, um, you, can, you can trace that directly into the, the evolution of, of tal the, the production of, of astrological talismans. Um, and one thing, of course, that happens there is that you're going from uh, a large, you know, temples, uh, you know, sort of state-sponsored uh, uh, temples uh, down to, to individual practitioners and often practitioners who are, uh, who are doing something in secret. Um, you know, that of course, in, in many uh, Christian and Judeo-Christian uh, cultures, all of these practices are illegal. So not only are you operating with your own limited funds, you may be doing so in secret. And so naturally what works in a, you know, in a big state-sponsored temple uh, doesn't necessarily work you know, in, in, in your basement or whatever. So there's a lot of adaptation of, of those religious, you know, large religious practices um, to, um, you know, to, to personal individual practices. And I, I just think that's an interesting perspective of seeing, you know, magicians as uh, a kind of scaled down version of, of, of the pagan priesthood. <clears throat> All right, so um, yeah, a couple other things here. Um, we often talk about the, the three hermetic arts of alchemy, astrology, and magic. Uh, and so in, 
when we, when we sort of classify the, uh, the esoteric practices in this way, divination is mostly going to be classified under, under magic. Um, astrology itself, as we'll maybe talk about a little bit more, um, is kind of ambiguously part of divination. There are aspects of astrology that are absolutely divination and other aspects of astrology that are, are questionable whether they really count as divination uh, or whether they're something else. I don't think we need to have a definitive answer there. Um, it's just, I think, worth noting that astrology is a little bit different than the other forms of divination that we'll be talking about. Um, so yeah, and under this classification, divination would be a kind of subcategory of magic. Um, sometimes there are, are important practices like necromancy, for example, which we can understand as divination by the spirits of the dead, um, is usually considered to be a part of ritual magic rather than divination. So again, there's some kind of fuzziness in, in classification and things like that. It's just worth being aware that the boundaries between these things are not absolute. Um, practices like scrying may be divinatory in nature, depending on what you're doing with them. Um, there certainly are ways of scrying. Uh, to try to you know, gain a, a vision of, of future events. But of course, there's other applications of scrying that have nothing to do with divination. Um, there's other historically important um, uh, div divinatory practices um, that we're not really going to talk about too much here, like chiromancy, that's palmistry, uh, physiognomy, uh, which is uh, essentially like palmistry, but applied to the entire body, uh, you know, the, the physical features as well as behavior being used uh, uh, in, in, in divinatory uh, method. Um, we also have the four uh, elemental forms of divination, pyromancy, divination by fire, by smoke, uh, by burning particular objects. Uh, aromancy, this would be divination by essentially by, by weather uh, or like meteorological phenomenon. Um, hydromancy, uh, divination by water, divination by you know, watching the surface of water, uh, the movement of particles over the surface of water. And then also um, what gets called geomancy, though it's not what we usually call geomancy, um, uh, which would be like divination by either things like earthquakes um, or by like the appearance uh, of the earth, you know, cracks in the earth or the features of the landscape or, or those sorts of things. So we can, you know, take, uh, uh, you know, omens from, from the elements here. Um, it's also worth noting that, especially like in the Renaissance times, um, although I think nowadays uh, you know, the practice of ceremonial magic, like daily practices of ceremonial magic, like you know, pentagram rituals and things like that, um, are often the kind of bread and butter of, of daily practice. Uh, in the Renaissance world, a lot of magicians, their daily practice and things that they were doing much more often and much more regularly would have been divinatory practices like geomancy, uh, whereas ritual magic was done, you know, it was a, was a much bigger production uh, done less often. So divination, although it's not so central to, to what we're doing nowadays, um, or at least it isn't considered that way, I, I think it, it still is. Um, you go back a few hundred years and it looks much more central to, to esoteric practitioners. But uh, the principal divinatory arts, you know, for, for our, you know, modern uh, Western esoteric tradition, the tradition of the you know, Golden Dawn and, and Thelema, I think we can, we can narrow it down to three main traditions, which would be astrology, uh, geomancy, and tarot. And we'll spend a little bit of time uh, talking about each one of these things, uh, as well as a, a few other um, uh, kind of minor uh, practices or, or things that are a little bit simpler. But yeah, I just want to spend a few minutes with, with each one of these things. Let's talk just, yeah, just for a minute about astrology. Uh, again, I'm, I'm sure most of you have a basic familiarity with astrology, or at least know what it is. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I'll talk a little bit about it. So uh, like divination in general, um, traditions of reading, you know, uh, uh, omens and signs in the heavens, you know, celestial events, the movement of planets, um, things like eclipses, you know, all of these sort of phenomena. Um, the reading, you know, omens and signs in, in those uh, in, in those phenomena are, are, are another kind of universal human thing um, found all across the world and extending, you know, back before a recorded history. Um, so although horoscopic astrology is a, a particular like formalization or development of that, it's worth noting that astrology in the broadest sense uh, is, is something much more universal than like the particular rules of horoscopic astrology that we practice. So the particular, you know, horoscopic astrology um, uh, that you know, we usually just call astrology um, has its roots in, in like Mesopotamian traditions, excuse me, um, which started as, as more like Roman traditions um, rather than being like the casting of horoscopes. Um, this sometimes included things that we don't really think of as part of astrology or that we don't include as part of astrology any longer, like um, you know, the appearance of the moon, 
um, if you know that the moon appears with with like kind of rings uh, around the you know kind of colored rings around the moon, which uh, I believe is usually produced by ice crystals in, in the atmosphere. Um, you know those might be taken as omens and those things interpreted. That's not really included in in, uh, in, in, in horoscopic astrology, but that's where the, these traditions uh, began. Um, is it, they primarily have their roots in these uh, yeah, Mesopotamian and Babylonian traditions. And the Babylonians actually really undertake a very uh, uh, basically like empirical study of these things. Um, they have kind of astrologer priests, you know, spread out, you know, all over the empire who are all making their own uh, independent observations uh, and then recording their predictions uh, and then sending their predictions into like the imperial capital. Uh, and then they observe, they see which predictions come true and which predictions don't. Uh, and this project is carried on for something like 600 years. And a lot of what they learn through this, this, this you know, centuries long uh, study of making predictions and seeing which ones come true and which ones don't, uh, gives us a lot of the basics uh, of, of the, the astrological rules that we still practice today. It's just interesting to think that that comes about through an actual like, empirical study. Um, the Egyptians also developed some of these, uh, these concepts. Um, they use um, uh, the stars, especially as like sacred calendars, um, both in the course of the day, like which um, stars would be rising over the horizon uh, was used it, during the night, uh, was used to, to time uh, you know, particular ritual actions, as well as uh, you know, like annual uh, cycles um, uh, used to, to time you know, festivals and, and other things. Um, so those two traditions, the Mesopotamian and the Egyptian traditions, um, are kind of brought together in the Hellenistic world and are also synthesized with like under the kind of under the aegis of, of Greek geometry and philosophy, uh, which in the third century, around the third century uh, of BCE, uh, you know, about 2,300 years ago, uh, gives rise to, to what we now you know, know as astrology. Um, uh, Hermes Trismegistus uh, is often uh, considered the, the inventor uh, of the astrological art, uh, and we'll see Hermes uh, connected to astrology a, a few more times uh, in our class today. Um, horoscopic astrology spreads you know, from the Hellenistic world, um, spreads all over the ancient world, uh, you know, to Persia, through the Arabic world, uh, into India, China, uh, and, and even as far as Japan. And then, of course, all those, you know, those places all develop their own um, you know, kind of unique versions of, of those things, um, but they all have this, this common source in, in Hellenistic Egypt. Um, and, you know, eventually this, this comes to Europe uh, in the kind of late medieval period uh, via translations of Arabic texts, uh, and then becomes a huge part of, of Renaissance uh, esoteric tradition and Renaissance practice. Um, it then sort of declines in Europe in the, in the 17th century, uh, you know, during, during the Enlightenment and the Reformation. Uh, and then is, is really reborn in the 19th century, uh, along with a lot of other esoteric practices, um, and now forms, you know, a, 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 and once again, you know, is, is a, a, the back, one of the, the real backbones of, um, of, of you know, modern esoteric practice. All right, so just looking a little closer into to what horoscopic astrology actually consists of. There are four main branches of, of horoscopic astrology generally. Um, these classifications are a little fuzzy and there's some things that don't quite fit neatly, but this is a good uh, kind of rough classification. Um, so we can talk about natal astrology. This is the one that's probably most familiar to most of you. Uh, natal astrology, you know, this is like the casting of, of birth charts for, for individuals, but it also includes a lot of other things. Um, like timing techniques uh, for individual people's lives, uh, the transits, um, things like progressions, solar returns, uh, medical applications, uh, the practice of synastry, and you know, then looking at uh, the relationship between different people's charts uh, and a lot of other um, applications as well. We also have what's called uh, inceptional astrology and electional astrology. Um, these are Basically, the same. You're looking at um, the chart of an event uh, or a, a, some sort of non the, the beginning of a of a you know a person or a, a non person like a you know business uh, or some sort of activity or undertaking. Um, electional is when you're using these techniques to choose a time to do something, uh, and then inceptional is when you're looking back at a time that something did begin. Uh, to talk about that thing. And this also has magical applications, you know, for electing you know, ritual work, uh, for making talismans, uh, you know, making uh, like petitions to the planetary powers, you know, all these things rely on the use of, of electional astrology, for choosing, uh, you know, the ideal moment to undertake those practices. 
We also have what's called mundane astrology. Um, this is actually the, in, you go back to the Mesopotamian world, mundane astrology is, is really the main and, and for a while the only form of astrology that they're doing. Um, this is looking at how the, the movements uh, of, of the planets, uh, how these things influence events that occur in the world, um, like talking about like global events uh, and, and these sort of things. And there's a lot of specialized techniques that are used in mundane astrology. Um, in the modern mundane astrology, one of the main things that is used is the, uh, the cycles and relationships between the outer planets. So you might look at, um, you know, the, the Pluto-Saturn cycle um, to talk about, you know, certain types of, of, you know, geopolitical events and things like that. Um, so there's, there's modern forms of mundane astrology as well, as well as a whole host of, of traditional techniques for doing these things. Um, of course, one simple way is just tracking, you know, the day-to-day the, the -day movement of the planets and looking how, at how that corresponds to various events happening in the world, you know, beyond just your own personal life, but, but in the, the larger world, in, in culture, um, you know, things like wars, elections, you know, all, all sorts of uh, events like that. And then finally, we have uh, horary astrology, which is the most obviously divinatory form of astrology. Um, the basic idea in horary astrology is that, uh, you know, someone comes to an astrologer and asks a question, uh, and the astrologer casts a chart for that particular moment in time, and then using a special set of interpretive rules, uh, answers that person's question. Um, so just to give a really, like, oversimplified sort of example, say, you know, you're an astrologer, and someone comes to you and says, um, you know, I'm, I'm involved in a, a, you know, a court case, a legal battle, um, you know, will, will I win? And so you cast a chart for the particular moment, but at, at that moment, at that time, the person asked the question, uh, and then you would use, like, for example, the planet that rules the first house to represent the person asking the question, and then the planet that rules the seventh house uh, to represent the other party, you know, in, in the legal dispute. Uh, and then you might look at, you know, the, the strength of those two planets, um, and the, the stronger planet, uh, you know, would indicate, uh, you know, if, if you know, the, the ruler of the first house is stronger than the ruler of the seventh, uh, you know, that would indicate the, um, that the, the person asking the question would win the legal case. Again, that's a, kind of an oversimplified uh, example. There's lots of other factors and, and things as well. Um, but that's basically how that works. Um, but that's very clearly, I think, different than other forms of astrology because there's no sense of causation there. The moment that the person asks the question, can't possibly be like the in what leads to that result, right? You might think that a, the natal chart, the moment that you're born in the position of the stars at that moment causes, you know, things to be a certain way in your life. But with this horary application, um, you know, there's no way of seeing that. So horary astrology is definitely of this kind of more magical divinatory application. And then the rest of astrology is where things are a little more, um, a little more ambiguous. So that's just something to, worth thinking about. Um, as I'm sure a lot of you know, that horror, um, horoscopic astrology, uh, the primary components of that are the planets themselves, as well as other points like the, the North and South node, the various comedic lots, uh, you know, asteroids, outer planets, all sorts of other points that are used in modern astrology. Uh, we have the, the signs of the zodiac, you know, which is the, the, the location of, of the planets, uh, and also the houses, which where the, the signs of the zodiac are the division of the ecliptic, um, the path uh, that the planets and, and, and the sun uh, you know, trace uh, through the sky um, over the course of, you know, well, for the sun, it's over the course of a year. Um, the other planets have other length cycles. Um, the houses are divisions of the sky, um, re, or yeah, they're divisions of the sky like relative to the horizon at the current moment. Um, so, you know, like the first house is related to the eastern horizon and whatever part of the ecliptic is rising up over the eastern horizon. So kind of, uh, we see with the, the signs of the zodiac being a more, um, you know, talking about something larger and more cosmic. And then with the houses, we have um, something a bit, a bit more personal and uh, like closer to, um, uh, you know, more specifically tied to a particular place at a very particular moment. And the houses give us, um, you know, different areas of life uh, or areas of the personality, depending on whether we're doing, um, you know, sort of psychological astrology or not. Um, it helps to, to locate uh, the, the different uh, celestial events within a person's life. And then we also have aspects and relationships between the planets, uh, so that the, the planets form relationships with each other, and this influences their, their, uh, their nature and their, their expression. 
let's see, I had an example chart here. We're running a, a little short on time, um, so I'm not gonna spend too much with it. Um, just, just an example uh, of the nail chart. Uh, this is the, the nail chart of, of Kenneth Anger, who I'm sure some of you are familiar with. Uh, he's an avant-garde filmmaker, um, as well as, as a practicing uh, occultist, um, very influenced by Philema. Um, you know, if you're not familiar with him, um, you should definitely look him up um, in, in his films. Um, you know, they're both important, you know, for, for the history, you know, uh, of uh, experimental cinema, um, as, as well as being, uh, you know, really important, um, uh, you know, esoteric uh, uh, art. Uh, and so again, here's, here's an example of, of, of his birth chart. Uh, and so you can see, you know, the, the, this is like the location of the planets, you know, relative to the, the signs of the zodiac, uh, as well as to the, the um, uh, you know, the particular place that he was born. And so he's a he's a Scorpio rising. Uh, and actually, one of his his most well known and important films is actually called Scorpio Rising. He was a practitioner of astrology himself. Uh, he was aware of this fact. Um, uh, you know, so that the sign Scorpio and its nature uh, absolutely characterizes him and, and um, his interests and his personality. Uh, and then you know, the other, again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here with this, um, but we can look at you know, the, the locations of the other planets uh, and their relationships to talk about, uh, you know, different aspects of, of his personality, of his life, uh, of, his, of his projects and, and, and how things have gone for him. Um, you know, just to point out one thing, for example, uh, in the fifth house, you know, that's Pisces, the fifth house is, among other things, uh, the house of, of you know, creativity uh, and, and you know, creative activity. Um, we see uh, Jupiter and Venus, uh, both very strongly placed and, and very positive, uh, uh, you know, powers here. Um, and, and he is, you know, he's, he's a really important uh, uh, creative, you know, creative figure, um, you know, very significant for, for the 20th century uh, uh, film making. Um, yeah, just keep moving on here. Um, but you know that, that's just sort of the, the basic idea of um, you know, we're reading again the, the locations of the planets um, and their relationships to each other and their relationship to the sky at the moment that he's born um, as as omens, you know, as signs, as as speaking to you know his own nature uh, and you know what his life is about and his work. Um, as well as his, you know, his strengths and weaknesses and things like that, right? We see Mars, you know, in the seventh house, um, and he was a, a contentious sort of person. He had a lot of falling out with people uh, that he worked with, um, and he could be a difficult sort of personality. Um, yeah, the, the, those types of things. Yeah, let's just keep moving on here. All right, so let's talk about our, our next form here, uh, geomancy. Um, geomancy is, is an important uh, form of, of divination, though it's, I think it's a bit neglected um, in um, the Golden Dawn and Philemic traditions, uh, unfortunately. Um, yeah, so let's just talk a little bit about, about where GMIC comes from and then we'll get into what it is. So it originates in the Islamic or Arabic speaking world um, in a, somewhere more than a thousand years ago, 12 or 1300 years ago ish, it's not really clear. Um, some people think that it originates in West Africa. It definitely spreads there, um, uh, you know, we see it spreading, if it does originate in the Arabic speaking world, um, it, it spreads to like the Persian world, to West Africa, and then eventually also to Europe in the, I think like 12th or, or I think 13th century, uh, it, it comes to Europe. Um, it's, it's still practiced in West Africa, like in, in Ifa, um, which is, I, I think, especially in, in uh, practiced in, in Nigeria. Um, and it's also practiced in a lot of the African uh, diaspora traditions as well. Um, like in Santeria, they're doing a, a form of geomancy. Um, it's not exactly the same uh, as, as uh, the kind of Western, you know, European uh, uh, tradition of geomancy, but it, it's very closely related. Although a lot of those practices, uh, like Ifa and, and in Santeria, um, they are initi initiated practices, so it's hard to know exactly what their interpretive rules are, because anyone who knows the rules is, is sworn to secrecy, um, but they are absolutely related. Um, so the word geomancy literally means earth divination, though it's a little bit of a, a misnomer. Um, it's a, a, a kind of a calc uh, from the Arabic uh, ilm al-ramal, uh, which means the science of the sand. Um, uh, as we'll talk about a little bit more, geomancy, there's a, a number of different ways of doing the kind of random chance um, uh, component of it. And one was by making marks. Um, you can make marks in the sand uh, or in dirt uh, or even on a sheet of paper. Uh, and so that's where the, the name, the science of the sand came from, um, but it's not actually particularly related to the, the element of earth. So the, the name of it can be a little bit misleading. 
Um, in the Arabic tradition, uh, geomancy is said to originate with, uh, with Idris, uh, who's a, a prophet from the Quran. Uh, and he's identified uh, with Enoch and with, with Hermes Trismegistus, um, just another example of, of Hermes uh, being related to um, uh, or, or connected to the origins of some of these divinatory practices. Uh, so yeah, as I said, it's, it's passing into Europe in the late medieval world. Um, it's, it's, it's really, it's the most popular divination system during the Renaissance and a lot of the great, excuse me, uh, you know, Renaissance uh, esoteric figures are all are, are practitioners of geomancy. Um, people like Agrippa, uh, Robert Flood, and, and many others uh, all, all practice, Christopher Catan, uh, all practice geomancy. Um, and like a number of other esoteric traditions, it's, it's lost uh, or, you know, in the 17th century, uh, and then is revived again in the 19th century, uh, and then the Golden Dawn has a lot to do with its revival. Um, I think since the Golden Dawn's time, um, there are a lot of scholars have looked back uh, and gotten uh, a better kind of historical grounding. Um, the, the Golden Dawn were practicing, uh, McGregor Mathers uh, had read uh, sort of a section of a single uh, a Latin text. Um, and so the, the, golden, the, the traditional Golden Dawn practice of geomancy um, doesn't have like the full set of rules and is a little bit idiosyncratic in certain ways. Um, but a lot of modern practitioners, um, people like John Michael Greer, for example, is a really important figure uh, in the, the contemporary uh, revival of geomancy. But it, you know, it was really the Golden Dawn that helped to, um, you know, to bring like renewed interest uh, and to get people like thinking about and, and practicing the system again. Um, so a, a geomantic divination uh, involves asking a question uh, and then generating you know, by, by chance uh, or by fortune. Uh, 16 odd or even numbered lines. Uh, these lines are then uh, combined and transformed into a series of figures that then answer the question that's asked. And so these odd and even numbered lines um, can be, again, are classically generated by um, making a series of dots or marks like faster than the, the conscious mind can count. Um, so you make 16 of these lines and then you're basically just looking at whether there's an odd or even number of points in each line. Um, but there's also lots of other ways of, of generating uh, that sort of sequence of 16 odds and evens. Um, you can roll dice, uh, draw cards. Um, yeah, there's, there's lots of other techniques for it. But um, yeah, making a series of, of points uh, is the, the classic way of doing it. Why 16? Um, well, so you'll, I'll show you in a minute um, how, uh, sort of how, how it works. Um, it isn't, the number 16 um, is not an incredibly important number in, in a lot of um, you know, modern ways of thinking about um, uh, you know, numerical uh, symbolism, um, but there are some other examples of, of 16 uh, as an important number uh, in the tradition, but I, I think that will be pretty clear in a second. Um, let's see, so the, the system of geomancy and its interpretation is, is very much based on astrological symbolism and astrological practice. Uh, and it's at, GMS is actually sometimes referred to as terrestrial astrology. So I'll show an example of a, uh, this is an example of what a geomantic reading uh, might look like. Um, so this is actually a, a real geomantic reading that I did, uh, not that long ago. So uh, we have these, these figures here, they're each made up of four lines, each consisting of one or two dots. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the figures in just a minute. Um, those 16 lines, uh, each, each one of those lines is making up one of the points of these four, uh, for the first four figures here um, that we see in like the top right of this box. Uh, and then everything else is just derived from those. Uh, so 16 is the, the 16 lines in the four primary figures. Uh, those figures are then transformed uh, and, and this leads to, uh, you know, they're given certain uh, values and significances and, and that is what uh, helps us answer the question. Um, let's see. Astrological 12 plus terrestrial 4 equals 16. Uh, yeah, that, that's it. That's a nice way of thinking about it. I, I like that question. <clears throat> let's see. So uh, just, just real briefly here, um, four examples of geomantic figures up, up at the top there. Um, these are kind of stylized as, as little like diamonds. But typically you just make it as a little like point or a mark there. It doesn't need to be that, that sort of diamond shape. Um, so each one is made up of, of four lines or positions. They're called the head, neck, uh, body, and feet. Uh, and they correspond to the, the elements of fire, air, water, and earth. Uh, so each line is either one point or two points, either odd or even. 
uh, and especially in modern uh, ways of looking at geomancy, the odd lines are often considered like manifest or active, uh, whereas the even is considered unmanifest or, or not present. Uh, and so we can analyze this by looking at whether, you know, for each one of the elements, whether that is, is manifest or present or active, uh, or whether it's unmanifest or, or passive. So, you know, there's an example how you can like, split up a figure there uh, and look at by the, by the elements. So uh, here's all 16 uh, of the geomantic figures here, right? So we have uh, four, you know, binary choices, uh, gives us two of the fourth possibilities uh, or 16 possible figures. Um, so here's another example of the 16, uh, is that there are 16 geomantic figures, uh, which obviously relates to the, the 16 lines uh, that we're drawing in the beginning. Um, each figure is also interpreted as an image uh, that relates to the figure's meaning besides just that like elemental way of interpreting it. Um, let's see, uh, just to give a few examples here, uh, the figure Albus uh, is often interpreted as a chalice, right? So these top two points is like the, the you know, the cup or the bowl uh, part of the chalice. And then here we have the stem uh, and then the base. Uh, whereas Rubeus is the same figure, but upside down as if the, the, the chalice has been, uh, or the cup has been tipped over and its contents have been spilled out. Um, let's see, it's another example. Uh, just trying to, they, they all have images, just trying to give a few simple examples. Um, of this figure here, Acquisitio, uh, which means gain, is interpreted as a bag uh, with its, the opening you know, facing up as if things are being put into the bag and there's accumulation. Whereas Emissio, loss is the same figure but upside down as if the bag has been inverted and the opening is now facing downwards and things are falling out of the bag. So we also have uh, images. Uh, each figure also forms a, a kind of image or picture that contributes to its meaning. The figures have both planetary and zodiacal correspondences. I'll show you the planetary correspondences in a moment. Uh, and an interesting thing about geomancy is also that the figures are very uh, context dependent. So for example, that figure Emissio um, that I just pointed out meaning loss, um, uh, normally, uh, or in many situations, uh, this would be not a great figure, right? If you were asking about a financial situation or some sort of project you were undertaking uh, or something like that, a missio would mean you know, you're going to lose money. It's, it's not going to happen. Uh, if you were, you're trying to find a lost object and you've got this figure, I mean, it's, it's, it's gone and it's never coming back, right? But if you're asking a question about love, uh, a missio uh, is, is a positive figure. A missio is ruled by Venus. Uh, and the idea would be that you, you lose your heart, right? That you, like, you fall in love. Um, so the same figure and the same image and idea uh, can have very different meanings depending on the correspondent, depending on the, the, the particular context. Um, so with geomancy, we're never just interpreting just one figure on its own and its inherent meaning, but we're always looking at relationships between figures and the particular context under which that, that figure appears, which I think is a, a really interesting feature of the system. <clears throat> All right, here are the, uh, the planetary correspondences of the figures. So you can see that each, uh, each of the seven classical planets, each rules uh, two of the figures. Uh, and then the north node or the, the head of the dragon, Capitricanus, uh, and the, the south node or tail of the dragon, uh, the, the, the nodes each have one figure and the seven classical planets each have two. And so this, this informs their, their meaning uh, quite a bit, their, um, their, their planetary correspondence. There are also zodiacal correspondences for the figures, um, but this is controversial. There's, I'm aware of at least three different systems of doing zodiacal correspondences, whereas every tradition that I'm aware of agrees about the planetary correspondences. All right, and then I just want to take a moment to look at um, Robert, uh, Robert Flood's uh, theory of geomancy. Well, you probably know who Flood was. He was a uh, 16th into 17th century um, uh, esotericist, um, also wrote a lot, he was also a musician, wrote a lot of musical theory, uh, a, a number of other subjects, um, uh, wrote about magic, um, and the diagrams from a lot of his books. You, you've, I'm sure, even if you don't know who he is, I'm sure you've seen uh, diagrams from, from his texts. Uh, they're reproduced quite a lot <clears throat> in like modern uh, esoteric texts. But anyways, this is a, a summary of uh, Flood's theory um, from the scholar uh, C.H. Johnston here. Um, and this is only a little bit of it too. Flood's actual theory of geomancy is quite complex, um, but we'll just look at a, a bit of it here. 
<clears throat> let's see. So uh, in, in Fled's theory, uh, the 16 lines of dots, which the geomancer produces at the beginning of the operation, are not caused merely by an adventitious movement of the hand, as the ignorant would say, but in the number and proportion of the dots of those 16 lines, a prophetic message of the soul lies concealed. Inasmuch as the dots establish correspondences with the 12 signs of the zodiac, the seven planets, and the four elements, they convey the messages of the soul by the macrocosmical vehicles of ether, which we could think of as like the quintessence or you know, the element of spirit, and the four elements. Without the aid of those macrocosmical vehicles, neither men's, uh, now men's means mind, uh, but in, in Flood's theory, this is um, uh, similar to the Greek concept of nous. Uh, it's it's the mind, uh, our, our kind of a kind of mind that is beyond the conscious mind. Um, in in Kabbalistic terms, we might think of this as being like neshama, you know, the, the higher unconscious. So neither mens uh, nor intellectus. This is like the intellect, uh, the, the the conscious uh, mind, uh, the conscious intellect. Neither mens uh, nor intellectus could have descended into man, and nothing real or essential can issue from mens unless it passes through through those media, meaning the um, the, you know, the, the soul and the intellect and the senses. The movement of the hand producing the geomantic dots is not accidental insofar as it proceeds from the human soul, man's very essence. Um, so the basic idea, again, the actual theory is, is more complex than this, but the basic idea here is that you are giving up rational conscious control of the hand that's making the dots so that your soul uh, in this, this higher, um, the kind of what we can call the higher unconscious uh, can determine the dots. So that in his view, they're not random. It isn't chance. It's just that your your the 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 conscious mind as well as the body and senses uh, are becoming vehicles for something higher uh, to to speak through uh, those things. <clears throat> Yeah, Trigger's quote saying the reason for the, oh yeah, you can use coins too. I don't know if I mentioned that before. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Trigger's quote, uh, explaining some more of the details. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so actually, I, I, was, I was just about to come back to that actually. Um, so yeah, again, uh, just looking at this in a, a fairly simplified sort of way. Um, again, not going into all the details. I, maybe I'll do a class about geomancy where we can actually like talk through how this is actually done, uh, right? The, the 16 uh, lines that are generated form the four mother figures. That's these four here. Um, those points are then rearranged uh, to form these four figures here known as the four daughters. Uh, and then the figures are combined together uh, to form the, the rows below, which is an interesting uh, aspect of geomancy is that the figures can be added together. Um, so if you're adding, say, like the, the, these two mother figures here, uh, we're adding like the, the, the top line of each. So one plus two is three, and that's an odd number. So that's why you have one point uh, in the figure below them. Then, you know, one plus one is two, so that's even, so we have an even number. Um, so they're constantly being added together, but then all that matters is whether our sum is, is odd or even. So these eight figures on the top are, are each, you know, paired off and added together to form these four figures here. And then these two are added together to form the right witness. And then these two are added together to form the left witness. And then the left and right witness are added together to form the judge. Uh, the judge is the primary figure that answers our question. Um, and we can also take the, uh, the top 12 figures and assign them uh, to an astrological chart. This is like a medieval style astrological chart. Uh, you know, modern astrological charts are circular, um, but the medieval style uh, has this kind of square uh, shape. But the, the meaning is basically the same. You know, if you've got the 12 houses and they have much the same meaning as in astrology. Uh, and then you can also analyze you know, which figures appear in which houses and some of their relationships between each other uh, to get more details uh, about, uh, you know, to, to, to be able to answer the question that you're asking. Uh, yeah, and we're running out of time. I was, I was going to actually like talk through briefly. Uh, this, this is actually a real geometric reading that I did, um, but uh, I'll just save it for another time. Uh, but that's just an example of, of what this looks like. And also just a, I think this is also a nice illustration of how, so uh, just a very simple procedure of generating uh, you know, 16 uh, odd or even um, uh, odd or even lines can produce quite a wealth of, of information and a, a huge amount of detail to be able to answer, um, you know, to be able to answer questions. And I found geomancy to be very, uh, very practical and to give very like practical, uh, clear answers to questions. I, I find it very useful. 
All right, so let's uh, just talk, you know, briefly about uh, about tarot. Again, I, I assume most of you who are, are familiar with at least the basics of, of tarot, and, and you've probably done some some tarot reading yourself. Um, so we don't need to spend a ton of time here. Um, but tarot can actually be seen as a, a subset of, uh, of of what's called cardomancy, you know, divination by cards. Um, there are other cardomantic systems. Um, you can use you know, decks of, of normal playing cards uh, uh, to do divination with. Uh, and there's also some other specialized divination decks like the, the Lenormand uh, deck. Um, and of course, nowadays, uh, people produce all sorts of oracle decks and, and things like that that have that same basic procedure of, of you know, shuffling a deck of cards and then laying them out um, uh, to, to, to answer a question or to give insight into some issue. So these actually evolved from card games, uh, which were, were used for gambling. Um, and it's interesting to think of the relationship between card games and gambling, uh, again, with that, uh, these ideas of, of chance. Um, you know, they're games of chance, uh, and then also you know, these, these divinatory practices that, that also utilize chance. Um, in, in the ancient world, uh, you know, this idea of the, the casting of lots. Uh, lots were cast um, you know, to, to make decisions and to gain information. You know, they were kind of divinatory practice. Um, but they're also very much, they were also used in some of the same ways that you might still like flip a coin uh, to make a decision. Uh, but the understanding, not that it was a random thing, but that um, you know, the, the correct uh, uh, result would come uh, from, the, from the chance procedure. And so you can see how that, that way of, of looking at chance and that way of looking at things that, that come about by chance uh, you know, intersects very closely with, with divination and making you know, games of chance and gambling actually very not, not far at all from, from divination. Um, let's see, so again, as we said, you know, the most significant form of, of cardamancy for our tradition uh, is the tarot. Uh, it has its roots in, in Renaissance Italy uh, and it finds its archetypal form in the, in the Tarot de Marseille, uh, produced in France. Um, let's see, so there are 78 cards in this deck, 22 trump cards, uh, and 56, uh, where sometimes called the minor arcana, uh, 56 cards which are divided into four suits. Um, beginning in the late uh, 18th century, uh, the, the, tarot card, the Tarot de Marseille uh, begins to be interpreted esoterically. Uh, and this esoteric interpretation of the tarot, especially through uh, LFS Levy, uh, eventually comes down to the, to the Golden Dawn. Uh, and the way that the, the, the structure of the tarot deck uh, is given like Kabbalistic correspondences and is, is some things are, are sort of reinterpreted along Kabbalistic lines uh, and tarot ends up becoming an extremely important part of, of modern uh, hermetic Kabbalah um, through that evolving tradition of, of esoteric interpretation uh, of this divinatory system. Um, it's also worth noting that, again, this isn't historically true, uh, but in that, that esoteric interpretation of the tarot uh, that starts in, in France, um, uh, the, the tarot was thought to be or, or was interpreted uh, as the Egyptian Book of Thoth. Um, you know, this, this, this lost uh, or, or sort of secretly preserved uh, book of, of ancient um, uh, of ancient Egyptian wisdom, uh, which again is historically true, but it's just one more uh, one more instance of, of one of these divination systems being related to you know, to Hermes, uh, to Thoth, and to, and to Hermes Trismegistus. All right, so uh, just really briefly here, the um, the structure of the tarot deck. Again, we have a seventy eight card deck, uh, so we have the twenty two major arcana or, or the, the twenty two trump cards. Um, these are attributed to the Hebrew alphabet uh, and to its, its correspondences. Uh, and we also have the, the 56 minor arcana. Um, now, the, the minor arcana are split into four suits. Um, again, these, these are sort of reinterpreted. Originally, the suit clubs was reinterpreted esoterically as wands. Um, uh, we also have cups, swords, uh, and then the suit of coins uh, is now often called discs or sometimes pentacles. Um, within each of the four, each one of those four suits uh, is made up of 14 cards. Uh, we have cards numbered, I said the ace, of course, is the one. Uh, so we have cards numbered, you know, one, one to 10, uh, and then four court cards as well. Um, in the esoteric decks, uh, the court cards are, are very much reinterpreted from what they were uh, in the Marseille, the Marseille deck. Um, but we don't really have time to go into to all the details of that. Um, just a, a brief look at how. Um, 
you know, how what, what came out of a, a card game uh, is then given sort of esoteric significance and the, the structure of the deck um, is, is lined up with these different uh, esoteric categories like the 22 Hebrew letters and you know, all of their elemental astrological uh, correspondences. Uh, you know, the four suits are attributed to the elements. The, the cards one through 10 are attributed to the you know, Pythagorean uh, symbolism of the numbers one through 10, the Pythagorean arithmology, uh, as well as the 10 Sephiroth and the tree of life. Um, and then the four core cards are given meanings um, along the same the kind of elemental lines uh, or uh, along the lines of the, uh, the tetragrammaton, the four letter uh, divine name of the Kabbalah. So by lining up, you know, the, the structure of the deck, um, the, these, the, the, those who developed this, you know, were able to imbue um, the cards, not just with their you know, divinatory meanings, um, but also these uh, kind of esoteric or, or Kabbalistic meanings. All right, and then just a quick uh, example, a uh, tarot reading. This is not a real reading I did. This is just a, a made up example. So you can see a few uh, examples of um, an older uh, Marseille uh, uh, deck there. Um, and in the tarot, there are many different spreads. Um, I, I, mean, there's, I, I don't know, hundreds, thousands of different spreads that people have, have developed at this point. Um, and you can, you can practice a lot of different spreads. And so the idea is that with each spread, uh, the cards are laid down you know, in, a particular, in a particular order. Uh, and in a particular position, so that each one of those positions, in a way not unlike astrological houses, each position uh, has a particular meaning. So this is one really classic spread called the French cross. Um, we have kind of a courtroom scene. So the cards on the left and right are, um, you know, a bit like the, the, the prosecution and the defense. You have the case for whatever's being asked and the case against. Uh, then the card at the top is the judge. And then the, uh, the, the fourth card at the bottom is the sentence that the judge passes. And then I didn't include it here, but you can also have an optional fifth card that uh, can be placed into the center, um, which you can use uh, if, you know, the four cards laid down aren't, aren't quite clear enough, you can lay a fifth card down into the center to answer your question. Um, but again, the, the inherent meanings of each one of the cards, as well as the cards relationship to each other, uh, is then combined with the positional meanings um, to be able to, to answer the question that you're asking. And so again, we have... Um, you know, I, I think again, it, it's interesting to think about, um, you know, the actual like, chance procedure, you know, the deck being shuffled and then laid down uh, and the way that, um, uh, that there's a, a coincidence or you know, a coinciding of the question that's being asked or the subject that's being investigated and then the cards that happen to be laid down. Right, so those are the three uh, kind of main systems um, uh, 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 of divination that, that we use in our tradition. Um, I've already done some classes and, and some of our other uh, uh, instructors have done classes on these things and I'm sure there'll be more to come. Like I said, we can totally do a class on, on geomancy at some point, that I think that'll be a lot of fun. Um, and you know, maybe I'll do some, some, tar uh, some stuff on tarot as well. So we can go into some more detail with these things. Um, I just wanted to give a brief kind of overview of these things and you know, to sort of see the way that, that different features of these systems uh, relate to each other and the way that those things uh, connect to some of the, the broader, you know, concepts uh, that we've been talking about here in our class. All right, so here's just a, a few other um, kind of simple divinatory techniques that, that many people uh, still practice today, as well as a, a couple of modern ones as well. So we have uh, what's called a, a, a neuromancy, which is a divination by dreams. Um, right, and so again, this is something you can find in, in all cultures throughout the world, and um, you know, some of you have maybe experienced you know, dreams that seem to um, either for, foretell the future uh, or perhaps just give you know deeper insight uh, into some sort of problem or, or some sort of situation or, or reveal something that you wouldn't otherwise have known. Um, the problem uh, or, or the kind of the issue that comes up with, with doing uh, this sort of divination by dreams is distinguishing false dreams, you know, meaningless dreams, uh, dreams that are based on you know, hopes or fears, uh, and then dreams that are actually conveying, um, you know, some sort of, of hidden information to us. Um, in the, the classical world, uh, in the Greek world, uh, this was symbolized by the idea that there were two gates uh, that dreams could come through. There was the, uh, the gate of ivory. Uh, where false dreams came, uh, and then the gate of horn, uh, where true dreams issued from. So you have these, this idea of like the two different sources of dreams. Um, and, you know, uh, we can take that as an image, of course, um, rather than anything as, as literally the case. 
uh, but still that ends up being um, not only the interpretation of dreams, but also the distinguish, distinguishing between different types of dreams uh, becomes kind of the, uh, the crux of the issue there when, when, when talking about this form of divination. Um, we also have what's sometimes called bibliomancy, uh, which is the divination uh, by a chance selection of a passage in a book, um, usually by opening the book at random, uh, sometimes in it, then closing your eyes uh, and just pointing to a passage, you know, uh, with your eyes closed, um, or sometimes by dropping like an object onto the page and the object falling on a particular word or sentence or passage of that page. Now, typically, you'd use a, a, a work that was uh, significant or sacred. Um, so, you know, uh, in the, the Greco-Roman world, uh, the works of the poets, like, like Homer, um, uh, for example, uh, were often used. Uh, Christians often use the Bible for this. Muslims use the Quran. Aleister Crowley and, and many other Thelemites have often used the holy books of Thelema for this purpose. Um, so again, same sort of idea. You, you ask a question or state the nature of whatever it is that you want more information about. You open the book to a random page, and then you know either with your eyes closed and your finger, or or Crowley used to drop his ring uh, onto the page, um, and then that whatever passage or word or sentence uh, is is indicated there, um, that is then understood as somehow answering uh, the question that's being asked. Um, other people that kind of modern uh, chaos magic magicians um, have extended this practice into other forms of, of media, uh, such as randomly, you know, turning on the TV or randomly changing the TV channels uh, to, to, to do much the same, um, you know, to do much the same effect. Some of you may also familiar, this is a, a, another thing that was influential in, in, in chaos magic, um, was uh, the, the author William Burroughs and, and the artist Brian Dyson, their, uh, their cut up method which is a method of taking, uh, taking a text uh, and, and cutting it into pieces and then rearranging those pieces uh, and then reading the new text that was produced thereby. Um, one just really simple, you could take like a, a page of text, uh, cut it into quadrants and then rearrange those quadrants uh, and then just read across the new text that was produced. So they originally developed this as, I think this is an interesting thing, they originally developed this as a formal procedure, you know, as a way of, um, uh, of, of sort of doing for, Burroughs talks about doing for writing, you know, what, what had already been done for painting, um, you know, as a modern you know, sort of formal procedure for producing, you know, literary art. But then as they practiced it, Burroughs began to feel that this actually had a, a divinatory, um, uh, a divinatory significance. Uh, and his kind of classic quote about this is he says, when, when you cut into the present, the future leaks out. Um, so he actually really began to feel that, that this was a divinatory practice that could reveal things about the nature of a text, uh, the nature of the author of a text, uh, or, or just about, you know, about the world. Uh, and that through this, this random uh, recombination of words and, and phrases, uh, again, something else came through and this, this random or chance procedure um, was uh, a, a, another sort of gateway for uh, some sort of, of esoteric uh, in, information to come through. Um, similarly, along those same lines, um, we also see a, a really close connection between um, the surrealist art practices uh, and divination as well, which I think is really interesting, especially, I think, for any of you who, who make art on your own. Um, you can absolutely bring uh, you know, art and, and divinatory practices together. Um, many of the surrealists uh, uh, were esoteric practitioners. Uh, many of them practiced astrology. Uh, it, many of them uh, uh, read the tarot uh, and were very interested in chance and the nature of chance. Um, and were very aware of the connection between the chance practices that they were bringing to art uh, and divination. It wasn't merely uh, uh, like a, a kind of rejection of, of like artistic intent, but actually them trying to, to do much the same thing that, that a diviner is doing uh, to allow for information to come through that, that is, is, is from a higher source than the conscious mind. Um, and indeed, you know, surreal, we, we tend to use the word surreal to mean just sort of weird or bizarre or unreal. Um, but their real intent was to, to reveal a reality that was, was higher than uh, normal kind of rational, objective, material uh, existence. Uh, and so they, they very consciously use these divinatory techniques um, in, in producing artwork.
Um, so we have two examples of, of paintings here um, by um, the, the surrealist painter, uh, Eiffel Calhoun, um, who is also uh, an esoteric uh, practitioner. She practiced a lot of magic in the, in the Golden Dawn tradition. Um, she actually tried to join uh, the Alpha and Omega uh, several times. Alpha and Omega was one of the um, one of the successors of the Golden Dawn. Uh, she actually tried to join the Alpha and Omega a few times, but uh, Mina Mathers uh, didn't like her uh, and, and refused to initiate her. Um, but in any case, uh, these are two of her paintings. Um, uh, you, you can see the, the, the method that she used to produce the, the painting on the right there, um, she actually called still a um, So you can see that she's very consciously uh, uh, seeing these paintings as, as divinatory uh, things. Um, the, the prefix there, still a, means like to drop. Um, this is essentially like a, a workshop lot. She's dropped things onto a page and then folded it in half. And then the figure that's been produced, she's then gone in and, and reworked it to bring out uh, the figure that, um, uh, you know, that the random or, or chance um, uh, arrangement of the, of the ink uh, suggested to her. <clears throat> but, you know, she's obviously very clearly and, and consciously thinking of, of that as, as a divinatory practice, um, which I, I think is just an interesting thing to think about, about the relationship between, between art and magic. Uh, and how you know these these magical techniques can can really overlap with, with artistic techniques and artistic practice. Let's see, Kristen saying she she just discovered uh, Calhoun uh, back in January. Yeah, she's she was a totally forgotten. I'm mean, both forgotten to the art world as well as forgotten to the esoteric world. Um, but just in the last I don't know three or four years, uh, it seems like she's she's been getting some more attention, uh, which is really great. Uh, and then other esoteric uh, practitioners and, and some of the, the female surrealists. Uh, have also people like uh, Leonor Carrington and uh, Remedius Bar have also been getting a lot of attention in the last few years, which is which is really cool to see. Um, yeah, okay, let's just just move on here because uh, we're oh we're already over time, so let's just wrap this up here. So uh, I just wanted to suggest um, that in addition to the formal practices of divination, um, we can also talk about broader practices of of reading omens and signs you know, in the world. Um, you know, just on a day-to-day on -day basis. Um, so paying attention to things like, you know, like, like synchronicity, as we've been talking about, uh, when events, especially inner and outer events, uh, seem to line up in, in some sort of meaningful way. Um, paying attention to our, um, uh, let's see, you paying attention to, to intuition, paying attention to dreams, uh, any other sorts of coincidences. These are all things that we can you know, simply pay more attention to and not just dismiss as, as mere chance or as, as mere like meaningless uh, events, but being open to, to, you know, to messages and to, to information coming through these methods. Um, I, I, well, I, we mostly just keep moving on here, but um, there's also the, this uh, theme of the idea of the world as a text or but in the Rosicrucian tradition is called the Libra Mundi, you know, the, the book of the world, the idea that the, the world itself or nature uh, is a kind of text uh, that can be read by, by one who is, is, is skilled in, in reading the signs. Um, and this obviously also overlaps um, our, our discussion of, of divination uh, with the, the concept of correspondences, the way that uh, particular objects or colors or you know, concepts and things uh, here in the material world correspond uh, with things in, in deeper or higher uh, levels of reality. So the entire idea of correspondences really becomes quite similar and related to, uh, to divinatory practice um, in the sense that you know, material events uh, uh, or, or, or things are understood you know, not, not merely as being physically produced, um, but as having this, uh, this higher or deeper sort of symbolic uh, meaning attached to them. Um, and so again, going back to some of these ideas about avoiding you know, what Blake was calling single vision, um, we can see that in the, the, the magical worldview, um, the world is seen as being you know, dense with meaning and, and being full of meaning. Uh, and I think especially as we investigate the number of different uh, divinatory practices that there are, and even like with just astrology by itself, how many techniques there are for being able to read a single astrological chart uh, and the way that you really get the sense that there's an unlimited amount of meaning in a single astrological chart that you could go to an infinite depth um, by applying techniques and by sort of zooming further and further into whatever it is that you're interested. Um, I think again, really gives the idea that there's 
there's an, an unlimited or, or kind of infinite like fractal density of meaning uh, within everything that happens and within these, these divinatory systems. Um, and I think that speaks you know, to a very deep level about the nature of reality, about the nature of the soul, about the, soul, the, the individual soul's relationship uh, uh, to the apparently external world um, that I, I think is, is, is really worth uh, you know, reflecting on. And you know, especially connected to, to spiritual themes, um, you know, we can see the, this sort of presence of meaning, in, in infinite kind of presence of meaning in everything as related to, to the imminence of the divine. Um, and to the, the sort of the constant you know, voice of the divine as uh, speaking to us through all things, um, and understanding like formal divination practice as just one as one way of, of accessing that meaning uh, and, and gaining uh, some sort of entry into that sort of meaning. Um, you know, with all of these things, though, I, I think it becomes important to to remain skeptical, you know, and to to investigate these things, to research them, uh, and, and to test things out. Um, you know, obviously, we don't want to go to that excess of of, of superstition, um, right? We want to be open to these things, uh, but still careful and, and and skeptical, and skeptical in the true sense of suspending judgment, right? So. If some you know, coincidences and things like that occur, you know, notice them and pay attention to them, but you don't have to leap to saying either that they are meaningful uh, or that they're not meaningful, right? We can, we can have that kind of skeptical suspension uh, of being interested, but open uh, you know, to, to various possibilities. And then just paying attention to whether we see more signs uh, that might you know, lead us to concluding that that something you know is happening here, that there is communication happening, or that we're interpreting those correctly, right? Just because something is a sign doesn't mean you're necessarily reading it uh, correctly. Um, you know, and, and the, the you know the personality, our own sort of hopes and fears, and all these sort of things can get in the way of, of correct interpretation, which is just just one more reason to be skeptical, right? Even if you're fully on board with this being a real phenomenon, um, you know, you should still be skeptical about whether you're, you're reading a given sign correctly. Um, there's also a nice concept uh, that's sometimes called the rule of three um, that I think is, doesn't need to be applied as an absolute rule, um, but can be a, a sort of useful, um, uh, a useful sort of guide to these things of looking for three instances uh, of something uh, for confirmation. If something happens once, you know, that's, that's interesting and maybe worth paying attention to. If something happens twice, you know, now we're, we're you know, there's, there's even, you know, even more, um, or if something happens once, you know, just sort of pay attention to it, but, you know, it's, it's not necessarily of any importance. If it happens twice, now we should really be starting to pay attention to something. And if it happens three times, um, now we, we, we can be pretty sure that, that it's, you know, it, it's something real. This can also be applied within divination too. Um, sometimes this is applied within astrology. For example, like in reading a chart, uh, if you have you know, one sign that points to, I don't know, financial difficulties, um, you know, that means there might be some financial difficulty, but you'd want to look at other, you know, there's always multiple factors in the chart that can speak to any individual topic. And so you'd want to look for like multiple confirmations, uh, or multiple things that speak to the same, um, you know, the, the same result. Uh, to have any kind of confidence about being able to make a prediction, right? So just, just one thing that looks like financial difficulty isn't enough to make that sort of prediction. But if you get three different you know, things within the same chart that all point in that same direction, then we can be a little more confident. <clears throat> all right, uh, again, just trying to move a little bit quickly here. Um, I just had some, um, some rules of thumb, kind of tips and things like that um, for approaching uh, from divination and, and for reading omens. One thing in, um, uh, that we might want to be aware of is uh, your own like physical and, and mental state uh, in, in approaching these things. You know, you should be in relatively you know, uh, good physical and mental health, um, calm, still, centered. Um, and also not strongly biased. Um, a, a lot of uh, diviners talk about um, sometimes if, if there's an issue that, that's really important to them and they have a lot of like emotional uh, attachment and connection uh, of not um, of, of, of actually going to like someone else to, to ask for a reading uh, rather than doing it for themselves because they know that they their own their own feelings and their own desires will will color or influence that. Um, Let's see, uh, some prayer and invocation um, can be a nice way of, of, 
you know, of, of making that connection to the, the sort of higher forces that both guide the divination itself, uh, as well as the interpretation thereof. Um, so, you know, you can, you can use those, you know, praying to a, a particular deity, perhaps one, you know, that's linked to, to the divinatory, the divi divination system itself that you're using, or when it's personally meaningful to you, or your own, you know, your own holy guardian angel or daimon, um, also, or to angels, to the divine in general, you know, whatever makes sense to you. So, um, as much as possible, you know, you should be in a, a receptive state for this. Um, or even a state of, of kind of ecstasy or rapture, um, which is people sometimes refer to as, as the divinish trance. Uh, this is something also that, that Robert Flood talks about uh, a lot in his theory about the particular state um, that you should be in in order for, for divination to work and in order to make that connection between you know, the hand making the, the geometric dots uh, and the soul that is informing those things. And you know, if that state isn't properly achieved, uh, there can be, um, you know, the, the message of the soul is not, uh, uh, doesn't come through clearly, you know, there can be distortion. Um, also, another principle here in, in line with some of the things we were saying about synchronicity, about the, the importance of uniqueness here, uh, is only doing one reading for a given question, right? Um, by, by repeating, uh, by repeating a question or asking a question multiple times, uh, we would be in a way violating the logic uh, that's involved here of the uniqueness of those situations. Um, and a lot of divin you know, divination traditions will specifically say that a second, third, fourth, et cetera, uh, divination done on a, on a given question uh, are, are invalid. But only the first time the question is asked uh, is, is the divination valid. Um, also something, and, and this is going to be, I think, very different depending on both the individual person as well as the particular system that you're using at the time, um, but finding the balance between like the rules of interpretation versus your intuition. Um, you know, the, you know, and ultimately you want those things kind of working together and working in harmony with each other, um, but deviating too far to either side um, can obviously lead us away from, from getting you know, good, uh, uh, useful information out of our, of our divination practices. Um, and that's something that I think we really just need to find by, by walking. I think early on, you know, if you're learning a divination system, you'll probably tend to rely on the rules, um, you know, by looking things up in the book um, uh, early on. And then as you go, um, you can make and get more comfortable with the system. You can make more and more room for intuition, um, but never leaving those rules behind. And ideally, those two things are working in harmony with each other. Um, and then finally, you know, as with all esoteric practices, um, you know, be open to experiment, you know, try things out. Um, uh, yeah, be open to experiment, you know, try things out and, and, and you'll know, keep a record and, and let that refine your techniques. You know, if, if you're making a prediction about something, record the prediction that you make and then be honest about whether that actually, uh, that actually happens. Um, you know, if, if you may find that a particular divination system works better for you than for others. Um, or you may find that particular techniques or methods work better for you. Um, and yeah, you know, coming to your own conclusions and, uh, and, and all of that. Um, and I think, that, again, a lot of them for, you know, for skepticism and, and kind of a, a more empirical sort of, of approach to these things. Let's see, we'll saying I've had an oracle pra uh, uh, practically say you aren't paying attention to what I told you. Yeah, that's great. All right, and then finally, uh, just last slide here uh, before we close up here. Um, I just wanted to say just a couple words about uh, the role of divination in, in spiritual training in, in the Flamish tradition in particular. So we can see that by, by practicing divination, we can achieve a number of things besides just you know, getting the, the answer to the particular question that we were asking. Um, you know, one thing we're doing here is learning the language of symbols and signs. Um, you know, it's one thing just to, to sort of study them in a book or to memorize the symbols, but when you actually have groups of symbols in relationship to each other and in the context of answering a particular question, that really forces you to take your, your knowledge of, of symbol and your skill in, in reading and interpreting uh, symbols uh, uh, to the next level. So it's just great training in, in learning the magical language. Um, 
you're also tr training yourself, you know, like I talked about a minute ago with that, that idea of like the diviner's trance. Um, you're training yourself to go into a receptive state uh, and, and to be attuned to subtler phenomenon, uh, to be attuned to the, you know, the, the voice of the divine, you know, speaking through, through, through your soul or through the apparently external world. Um, you know, you're becoming, yeah, you're becoming attuned to those things and more receptive. Another thing, of course, is that it, it, it just works. You can actually get you know, guidance and information. Uh, it, it's simply useful, uh, both for daily life uh, you know, and on, on your, your spiritual path. Um, it can just be a, a source of, of good information. Um, it's also useful in combination with other magical practices. Um, there's lots of examples here. Um, I just gave two here. One is, is doing like astrological elections for rituals. Um, you know, the ritual itself you're doing may not be particularly astrological in nature and may not be a divinatory ritual, but you know, you're applying um, you know, so, uh, uh, like a divinatory procedure in order to choose a time to do a ritual, for example. Um, and sometimes divination practices can also be used for communicating with spirits. Um, you know, if, you, if you've done some sort of a, a, you know, like an evocation of a, of a spirit, um, you, could you could use a divinatory method as a communication method uh, between you and, and the spirit. Um, again, uh, kind of in line with that, that idea of, of attuning to solar forces, you know, you're also connecting to divine or, or, or cosmic forces um, and building that relationship in your life, you know, as you actually use this for practical purposes, um, you know, your life isn't just being guided by, you know, the rational human, you know, intellect, um, but there's actually the guidance of, of, of something higher and, and, and deeper uh, now actually entering your life in a, in a practical way. Um, and you know, again, along those lines, uh, sort of circumventing the, the personality's own individual desires or ideas uh, and aligning, you know, with, with both the individual will and, uh, you know, what we call the cosmic uh, or divine will. So uh, I kind of rushed the, the last section there, um, but I, I hope um, uh, <clears throat> you know I hope I hope some of those, those points uh, kind of came through. And uh, thanks for your patience and going over time here. Um, I'm happy to hang out for a couple of minutes if anybody has any other um, uh, comments. There's been some interesting uh, conversation going on in the chat here. Um, but yeah, if anybody has any other questions or comments, uh, feel free to type them in there. Uh, for more information about our work, um, you can go to tots.org uh, slash FAQ. Uh, if you'd like to contact me uh, or be added to the public Google group, uh, you can feel free to email me there at, at provost.tots.org. Uh, and as always, we have a $5 uh, suggested donation for anyone who's not a member of either our academic or our initiatory tracks. Uh, and if you'd like to make such a donation, uh, you can send it via PayPal to, to payments at, at tots.org. Um, so yeah, thanks everybody. Um, I hope this has been a nice, um, both maybe introduction to some of these, these divination systems, uh, as well as a consideration of some of their, their importance, you know, uh, both sort of philosophically, um, spiritually, uh, and in, in relationship to the broader um, uh, uh, spiritual and, and magical training. So yeah, thanks everybody. Thanks for coming. I appreciate it. Um, Let's see, I don't see any questions coming through here, so I am going to stop the recording. And for anybody watching on YouTube, uh, you know, thanks for watching, uh, and be sure to subscribe to our channel so you can get updates on, uh, on new videos coming out. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>